Reading practice. Improve your pronunciation in English. You'll get used to it, Padraig says quietly, leading me over to the living area. I heard that, his grandmother calls out from the kitchen. The living area is beyond cosy, with a roaring fire at one end, a plush couch, and two doily accented armchairs. In the middle is an old wooden coffee table littered with brochures and a guest book. Even if the next few days end up being crazy, at least I can say I stayed in a genuine Irish house in the country. Where's me old man? he asks. He's only home for a few minutes and already his accent is deepening. He's in the cottage taking a nap. She answers from around the corner. You'll see him later. We sit down on the couch and Padraig puts his arm around me, and I settle into him like it's second nature, and for a moment there, I really believe this could be real. It feels real, being with him like this. Just easy and casual and protected by his big burly mass in this quaint, cozy home. Then his grandmother comes out, putting her hands on her hips and stopping in the kitchen doorway, eyeing us. Now, do you want a mineral before your tea? A mineral? Just tea is fine, Padraig says. Ah, go way out of that. She looks tired. She needs a wee mineral. I'll get some for ye both. She disappears, and I look at Padraig. A what? Old folk like to force feed it on ye, he whispers in my ear, causing very inappropriate shivers to cascade down my back. It's just seven up. Oh. I never drink soft drinks. My mother never had them in the house growing up, and if I ever indulged she told me I'd just get fatter. Which, in hindsight, was probably a healthy thing to do, even if it didn't come from a health-conscious place. Still, when his grandmother delivers us two glasses of 7-Up and says she's going back to wet the tea, I end up drinking half of it in one go. Guess I was thirsty, or perhaps just deprived of corn syrupy goodness. By the time she comes out with the pot of tea, I've finished the glass. She looks mildly impressed and says to Padraig, Yeah, see, your WAN needed a good mineral. She looks the picture of health already. I watch as she pours us tea, her hands remarkably steady. Now, please, one of ye explain what's going on here. Padraig, ye never mentioned a lass when we talked and now here she is. This is like hen's teeth, ye you know it. Well, Padraig says, sitting up straighter. He takes his arm out from around my shoulder and puts his hand on my knee. I have something to tell ye and I'm glad you're sitting down. I figured I would wait for Dad to wake up. That would take donkey's years, she says. Now, what's the story? I ain't getting younger. Padre gives me an anxious smile squeezing my hand before turning to his grandmother. Here we go. Valerie isn't just my girlfriend, Nan. She's my fiancé. We're getting married. A big, heavy pause fills the air while his grandmother frowns, scrutinizing us. 
Finally she leans back in her chair and gives us a dismissive wave, looking the other way. Oh, away with ye. You're codding me, aren't ye? Padraig laughs gently. I'm serious. We're engaged. She looks back at us, arms crossed and lips pursed. I'm supposed to believe ye. Where's her ring? You're a real Egypt if you propose without a ring. Didn't your mother teach you better than that? I know she did because I raised her better than that. I'm not sure at first what Padraig is going to say, but from the way he's not looking at me, I have an idea. I don't have a ring because I wanted to ask Dad if I could use Mam's. I think it would mean a lot to him, and to Mam, if I could give that ring to Valerie. Let the ring live on. Do you know what I mean like? I keep the smile plastered on my face though I don't feel good about it at all. I know Padraig is coming from a good place, albeit a desperate one, and I am not one to judge what someone does to appease their family, because, believe me, I'm no angel in that department. But it does feel like he's not taking the implication seriously. However, it does seem to work on his grandmother because her features soften. Merciful Jesus in heaven, you're serious. He nods, his grip on my knee tighter. We're very much in love and that ring would do us a great honor. Ouch. The very much in love part. Who knew I would feel something from that? She stares at him some more, then at me. Finally she says, your father might just have a heart attack when he wakes up to this news. But he'll be happy, yeah, he asks, his tone anxious. This is all he's wanted, the whole reason for doing this. There's a twinkle in her eyes she sips her tea. We'll have to wait and see, won't we? Padraig I wasn't shocked that my nan didn't believe me at first. After all, the only times my family has seen me with a girl was when someone I was briefly hooking up with was photographed in the tabloids. Announcing that I suddenly have a fiancé is, as my nan's colourful words put it, as rare as hen's teeth. But she did believe it, especially as I gave the story about the ring. Which, I didn't at all feel bad about until Valerie practically berated me in the car earlier for even suggesting it. I know why she thought it wasn't a wise idea. The last thing I want is for it to seem like I'm spitting on my mam's grave. But the truth is, it would mean something to my dad. As long as he never finds out the truth, then he can die knowing I found true love and that this love pays tribute to the love between my parents. When it comes to jinxing or cursing future love for me though, I'm not worried. Maybe it seems like crying wolf to Valerie but I was honest with her when I said I wouldn't be getting married to anyone. A fake engagement is enough, even though sometimes when I look at Valerie I'm hit with this feeling, deep in the seat of me, that what we have could become something more under different circumstances. But these circumstances are what we have and she doesn't know everything. She doesn't know what I'm really going through and hopefully she doesn't ever have to know. Hopefully my father won't either. When we're done with our tea and my nan has warmed up to the idea that Valerie is my fiancé, she gives her a quick tour of the place and I grab our luggage from the car. 
She puts Valerie in the biggest bedroom upstairs, with the best view over the back gardens, cottage, mews, field, and forest. No surprise, she puts me downstairs beside Major's bedroom. Well, hello young fella, Major says as he steps out of his room and sees the three of us in the hallway. Didn't know you'd be by. It's been a while. And he's staying a while this time, aren't ye boy? Nan says, nudging me with her sharp elbows. What's that? The major says loudly, gesturing to his ear. She said I'm staying a while, I say, raising my voice. What? I'm staying a while. See, the major got his name because he was a major in the army back in the day and is always sharply dressed in a suit, like he is now, even though he doesn't go anywhere except the pub. But unlike the character in Faulty Towers, he's not senile, just hard of hearing, and he refuses to wear a hearing aid. Ah he says with a nod. He claps his hands together and smiles. Good. We make quick, albeit loud, introductions to Valerie, then my nan takes her around the property, to the archery set up in the walled garden and the falconry muse, an owl is the B and BS logo, and it's what we're most known for. Meanwhile, it's time for me to say hello to my father. I take in a deep breath and head over to the stone cottage, which is where I actually grew up. I open the door and step inside and am hit with a wave of nostalgia. The smell of the stone in winter, the wood burning on the fire, the dust of the thick rugs and woolen throws. It's been a few years since I've been back and yet I'm instantly transported back to when I was a child. There's two bedrooms, the toilet, the small kitchen, the dining room with the same round table, the living area, and just off of that, a tiny alcove lined with books where my mother would spend her time reading and writing poetry. It hurts as it often does when I come here. The loss of her. Such a fucking loss. I was 16 when it happened and I've never been the same since. There is a part of me that's deeper than my heart and my soul where she resided, a part missing that I'll never get back. It's the infinite space that a mother takes up that becomes a black hole when she's gone. After time, it stops spreading, it stops eating the stars within you, but it's still there. Just this black, hungry pit that makes you ache to your bones with loss. I imagine my father feels the same. He was never the same after, either and our relationship collapsed under the weight of our shared grief. We turned on each other and away from each other. I stare at that chair in the alcove, picturing her with her reading glasses on, the lamp illuminating her notebook, scribbling away with her tongue half out of her mouth in concentration. When she wrote her poems she was consumed. My nan framed several of them and hung them up all over the B&B, &B, so proud. I close my eyes and think, please understand what I'm about to do and why I have to lie. I open my eyes when my hand starts to shake, feeling numb. I make a fist, refusing to let this ailment become my focus, and turn toward my parents' bedroom. I can't ever stop thinking it in plural. 
The door is already open a crack so I slowly push it open. The room smells sterile and sharp. My father is lying in bed and sleeping, only a thin sheet over him, covers piled at his feet. It takes me a moment to recognize him. I blink and I blink. My father was always a big man. As tall as me, though he'd always said he was an inch taller, but definitely with more muscles that later in life turned into bulk. They called him the bear on the rugby field. But he's not a bear anymore. He's lost an obscene amount of weight. Maybe a hundred pounds. His thick dark hair that he used to dye is now all white and falling out. His skin is pale though thankfully doesn't look sallow. Somehow he even looks shorter. I watch him for a moment, my breath held in my throat, hating myself for not coming sooner. I should have come back the moment they said he was sick. I shouldn't have assumed it was nothing, no matter what they said. What would have been the harm? So maybe we would have fought or maybe things would end worse, but at least I would have seen him before he got to this. This doesn't seem fair. This hurts. I should get out of here. I turn and head to the door but then hear a snort and a loud, who's there? I slowly turn around and see him squinting at me, fumbling for his glasses that are on the bedside table. I go over and grab them, handing them to him. It's me. It's Padraig. He takes his glasses from me and puts them on. I can't fall asleep in these, you know, I keep breaking them, he says, clearing his throat. I'm relieved to hear his voice is strong, and when he glances at me through his glasses, his dark eyes are bright. He raises his brow. So you're here. I didn't think you'd come, he says gruffly. Your nan said you would but I didn't believe it. I would have come sooner, I say quickly. I just didn't know. When I talked to nan she said you were fine, that it wasn't a big deal, that. He waves his hand at me dismissively. Yeah, any more of this and they'll be less of that. I don't need your explanations, son. You're here now. Are ye glad I came? I ask, like a pitiful child. He squints at me. It depends. You here to make my last days a living hell or what? Days? My heart nearly stops. Nan told you me you had a few good months left, maybe more. He scoffs, closing his eyes and removing his glasses. What difference does it make? Time, it just goes. Every day, it just goes, faster and faster. When you're near the end, whether it's a few days or months, it's all the same. All a bucket of shite. I'm not about to argue with him about that. He opens his eyes and turns to look at me. I know I'm fuzzy to him without his glasses but I have a feeling he prefers it that way. He doesn't really have to see me. So ye here for supper or what? He asks after a moment. I'm here for a long time. He frowns. Why? Don't tell me it's because of me. I might hang on for longer than you think. 
The devil is funny like that. I shrug. We'll see how it goes. But I told Nan I'd be here and so I am. So noble, aren't ye? He mutters under his breath. I want to be here. Away with ye. That's a lie. She guilt ye into coming here and it worked. But ye don't have to stay. I asked a girl to marry me. He blinks, taken aback. And was it any use? She said yes. She's here now. You'll meet her at dinner. He shakes his head. She's up the pole, ain't she? She's not pregnant. We're in love. I asked her to marry me and she said yes. The lying makes me feel uneasy so I add, her name is Valerie and she's lovely. He scoffs. Valerie. And where is she from? Where did you find her? We met a year ago in Dublin. Ah, figures she'd be from the pale. Actually, she's from Philadelphia. An American, he says, looking more impressed than Nan did. And so what on earth could she want with ye? She a rugby fan. She doesn't even know the rules. So, no. Just a fan of you, then. It appears so. I suppose you want me to offer you congratulations or be proud of ye, he asks tiredly. I swallow hard. That would be nice, yes. He sighs. Well, congratulations then. Sorry I can't be more chuffed about it. The painkillers stuff my head up a lot. Then there's the whole dying thing. I wonder if he wasn't dying if he'd still give a rat's ass about my getting married or not. I need for this to matter to him. I need to make him proud. But I can't force that. Perhaps it's too early. Perhaps this is just the first stage of repairing what we had before it's too late. Are ye in a lot of pain? I ask. Sometimes. Like now. Usually when I wake up. He tries to sit up straighter and jerks his chin to the dresser. Your nan puts the medication up there, like she thinks I'm going to take it all at once and get smashed. Do me a favor and bring them over. I go over to the bottles and plop them down on my dad's lap. Are they all for pain? He nods, slipping his glasses back on to read the label. One is for my blood pressure. Apparently that's still important. I don't know why. The rest are the good stuff. He's fumbling with the lid of one, trying to open it but his hands are weak. Here, let me. I take the bottle from him and try but the numbness and the tremors in my hand from earlier come back with a vengeance. I drop the bottle on the bed and quickly put my hand behind me to hide the shaking. What's wrong with ye? he asks taking the bottle and frowning at me. And I ain't a cripple, you know. I'll get you some water, I tell him quickly, and with my good hand, I take the empty cup from beside his bed and head out into the kitchen. I run the tap for a few seconds and splash cold water on my face, 
trying to calm down. I pinch my eyes shut and take in a few deep breaths, water running over the tip of my nose, before I hold out my hand in front of me and look at it. It's still. Steady as a rock. Like nothing happened. Thank God, I think, and promptly fill up the glass with water. Did ye get lost? My dad says as I come back in his room. It's been so long since you've been back, I wouldn't have blamed ye. I give him the glass and watch him swallow his pills. Then I surprise myself by asking, can I have a few of those? He coughs on his water. What for? Are ye still in pain from the concussion? I nod. I lie. Yeah. I heard that you were almost healed. That you were going to be going back to the game soon. It's going to take some time. Meanwhile, I'll be here and I'll rest. He gives me a wry smile. I doubt you'll be resting if you have your WAN here. I chuckle. I don't know about that. Nan is in charge and she's placed us as far away from each other as possible. He takes out a handful of pills and places them in my palm. Then you might need these after all. But don't take them too often. One pill will do. Thank you, Dad. I tell him. Do you need anything else? I'm grand, he says. Then I'll see you at dinner? If I'm not dead before then, yes. Even though my visit with my dad this afternoon didn't go exactly as I'd hoped, I figured a few days with Valerie around and he might be as charmed by her as I am. I also figured I'd have some time with Valerie alone before dinner, maybe to head into town and check out some shops or take a walk, but when I got back from the cottage, I ran into Nan in the kitchen who told me that Valerie was taking a nap and wasn't to be disturbed. She eyed her favourite wooden spoon as she said that, so I knew I shouldn't take my chances. Can I help you with anything? I ask as I watch her putter about the kitchen, taking vegetables out of the fridge. Don't ye have that maid, Inga, or whatever her name is? I don't need your help but you're a dear for asking, she says rather cheerfully as she brings out a sharp knife from the drawer. And Inga is long gone. I caught her having a fling with one of the guests so she had to go. Right back to Sweden, for feck's sake. Shite. This place really is turning into faulty towers. It doesn't matter anyway, it all worked out for the best. You remember Gail from next door? How could I forget Gail? She was the neighbor's daughter I'd lost my virginity to. Nice girl, but a bit of a mess. I remember, I say carefully. Maybe she forgot the time she caught us together. Well, she was studying abroad, art or something exotic like that, and then decided she wanted to come back home to shambles. Frankly, I think she ran out of money. All the girls in that house seemed to come back home for a wee while. I'd gone over there to get some eggs from their hens and she was looking for a job and there ye have it. She's our new maid. Oh, I say. That's good. Gail and I had a rather tumultuous time in our teens. 
You know how it is when you're sleeping with one of the girls next door. I didn't really see her much when I started playing professionally but she's always been weird around me. Hopefully she's gotten over it by now. Yeah, she's a real help she is. She makes breakfast in the morning so I can have a wee break, cleans the rooms, does the guests washing. And in the evenings she'll come over for dinner, help with serving the guests if there are any, and help your dad on over. He can walk fine, he just needs a little support some days and you know how he is, he won't dare rely on his mother-in-law. She clears her throat and spears me with her gaze as she starts to hack away at the carrots. Now, enough about that. Tell me about her. Valerie. What do you want to know? I don't like talking about her when she's not here. It's hard to keep our stories straight. She's a looker, she is. Real beauty. If your mum were with us instead of looking down at us, she'd say she's like a fine Irish winter day. An old-fashioned kind of woman. Fair play to ye, Padraig. You did good. So you like her? Very much. She passed the test dealing with me at any rate. She's smart. Soulful. I trust her with your heart and that's the most important thing. You can never be too careful, you know. You're successful and handsome, despite those ugly tattoos on your body and that frightful beard covering your face. You have money and fame. A lot of women are only after those things, not ye heart. But Valerie, she's after your heart and nothing less. And you deserve it, my boy. My own heart seems to skip clumsily in my chest, like it's slowly waking up from a long hibernation. I want what my nan is saying to be true. I want to be able to trust Valerie, not just in this charade but beyond that. But it doesn't seem possible, not with the way things are laid out before us. We've come back to my hometown to live out a lie. How can anything real spring from that? I spend the next couple of hours with Nan, helping out even though she keeps trying to shoo me away, or snacking on her cut-up vegetables, which she smacks out of my hand. I ask about how people in town are since the only people I keep in touch with is my mate Alistair who runs a pub down the road, and she talks and talks. She's always had the gift of the gab. Before I know it, the food is cooking away and she's telling me I better go wake up Valerie so she can come down for dinner. I finish setting the dining room table for us, then head up the narrow stairs to Valerie's room. I knock on her door softly and don't hear a response. Valerie. I say. If we were actually engaged I would just barge right on in there, but because I'm not sure how comfortable she is with me yet, I don't want to impose. Hey, I hear her groggy voice. Come in. I slowly open the door and peer inside the dim room. She's lying on top of the bed her scarlet hair spilled out all around her, trying to push up onto her elbows. My God. I could sleep forever. She squints out the window and sees the deepening twilight. What time is it? I walk over to her and flick on the bedside light. It's almost dinner time. 
But if you need to sleep more, then that's no problem. I'll tell them it's jet lag. Jet lag, she says. I thought I've been here since before Christmas. Oh right. Shite. That would have been a disaster if I'd mentioned that. Already our stories are hard to keep straight. Forgot. But I can say you're sick. I have to say, you're making it mighty hard not to get into that bed with ye. She grins at me, looking both bashful and flirtatious at once. I wouldn't complain, she says. Then she bites her lip and that makes me want to do the same. I lean in and kiss her softly, capturing her mouth with mine. The feel of her lips goes right through me like a burning arrow and I'm immediately hard as sin, my erection pressing against my fly. I kiss her with more hunger now, wanting, needing, craving her. How quickly my brain shuts off, along with the charade and the logic, and I just have this undeniable urge to get inside her again. I climb on top of the bed, the mattress creaking under my weight, and prowl over her. She whimpers as I kiss her, and for a moment I think I'm being too forward, too pushy, that the one night stand was all that we had. Then she takes her hand and presses it against my cock, as if she's greedy for it. Fuck me, I gasp out hoarsely my kiss deepening, hot and wet and starving, my hands going underneath her jumper and squeezing her tits, my desire for her becoming something uncontrollable. In the tiny lizard brain I have at the moment, I'm trying to calculate how we can quickly fuck without anyone noticing. Padraig, my nan's booming voice echoes from downstairs. Stop faffing about and get your ass down here. Instant erection killer. Breathing heavily, I look at Valerie, her hair wild, her lips wet and red, her cheeks flushed. Fuck, she's so bloody beautiful. I am in such a fucking mess with this woman. Faffing about. Valerie asks, trying not to smile. Like. She gestures a jerking off movement with her hand, which is somehow very hot. I chuckle and smooth the hair off her face. Not fapping. Faffin. Faffin about means you're dicking around. Or should I say wasting time? My nan may have a sharp tongue but she ain't up to date with internet speak. I pause. Thank the Lord. We get off the bed, sort ourselves out, then head to dinner. I pause at the top of the stairs and pull her close to me. You ready? She nods anxiously. Yes. No. She shakes her head. Don't be nervous, I tell her, leaning in and smiling. Kiss me. Kiss me, you're Irish. Kiss me, I'm Padraig McCarthy, I tell her. Kiss me for luck. Oh, so you're like the Blarney Stone now, is that it? But then she quickly kisses me on the lips. And, I know it's formal of you to call me Valerie, but since we're engaged and all, I was hoping you could call me Val. Val it is. I grab her hand and lead her down the stairs. My father is already sitting down at the head of the table, my nan beside him. 
He looks a lot better than he did earlier, maybe because he's in a nice flannel shirt and his hair is combed back and he's high on pain meds. He's wearing his glasses too, which I'm secretly happy about. I want him to see how beautiful Valerie Val is. Dad, I say proudly as I lead Val over to the table. This is Valerie, my fiancé. So nice to meet you, she says to him, and because it's apparent that he's not going to be getting up, she gives an awkward curtsy. What are you doing that for? He frowns at her. I'm only dying, I'm not the king. Her face goes red to her roots. I laugh and squeeze her hand. If she sees ye as king, dad, I wouldn't argue with her. His lips curl into what can barely be called a smile. I suppose I should take what I can get in this house. Well, well, sit down and eat. We take our seats on the opposite side of the table. There's a bowl of simple salad in front of us as a starter, which we all tuck into, passing each other salt, pepper, and salad dressing. Val is looking at the two other empty places at the table just as the major comes out to take his seat at one. Ah, salad, he says, clapping his hands together. Just like yesterday and the day before and the day before that. He's still dressed in his brown suit that looks like it's been found at the bottom of a thrift store bin. You eat it and you like it, my nan says threateningly. What's that you say? My nan closes her eyes, shaking her head. Merciful Jesus in heaven, she mumbles. Then Gail steps out of the kitchen, holding the giant pot of Irish stew my nan had been working on all day. Gail's not surprised to see me, so she must have been warned. She looks good, too, if not a little on the skinny side with dark circles under her eyes. How ya, Padraig? It's been a long time. She says this lightly but I swear I see some bitterness on her lips, like she just sucked on a lemon. Things good with ye? Yeah, things are grand, I tell her. Which, of course, is complete shite. Funny how we say that automatically even if it isn't true, which makes all of us liars at some point during our day. Welcome back to shambles. She gives a wincing smile as she puts the pot of stew in the middle of the table. I'd say the same to you but I'm guessing you're not to stay long. She takes her seat beside the Major and eyes Valerie. I heard the good news. Congratulations. What's the good news? The Major asks, even though we'd told him earlier. Padraig and this lady here are getting married, she says loudly and in his ear. Oh, that's a fret, he says. Fair play to ye, Padraig, she's a fine thing. He looks to my father and my nan. And you two have been keeping it a secret. My father is picking away at his salad, ignoring that. I've noticed he's barely eaten any of it. So when is the wedding? Gail asks, scooping out stew into everyone's bowls. Yes, Padraig. When is the blooming wedding? My nan asks. I I Val and she nods, taking the reins. 
we don't know yet. It depends on Padraig's schedule when he goes back to play. I try not to wince since I may never go back to play. But she doesn't know that and neither does anyone else. So your concussion is all healed up then? Gail asks. That was a brutal hit you took. It was. Very unlike you to fuck it up like that, my dad adds. I still don't understand what the hell happened. Colin, my nan admonishes him. Please, let us eat before you start mentioning hell. You're the one talking about the bloody devil all the time, he grumbles back to her. Only because I like to have him on my side, she says, pointing her fork at him in a hostile manner. And what's done is done. No point making the poor boy feel bad, he's been through enough. We only got engaged over Christmas, Val speaks up, trying to change the subject. So we haven't really planned anything yet. It's all so new, she adds brightly. Where is your ring? Gail asks, staring at Val's hands but glancing expectantly at me. You've all the money in the world, I would have thought should ye ever get married, your miss would be rolling in diamonds. It's not the time to be cheap, Padraig, my dad adds. I exchange a glance with Val and my nan and then clear my throat. Well, Dad, I meant to ask you this earlier. But the reason she doesn't have a ring was I was hoping I could use Mam's engagement ring. The room goes silent. Everyone stops eating and looks at my father. Except for Major, who goes. What's that you say? My father frowns and then takes his glasses off and puts them back on, as if that will reset the question. You want to use the ring I gave your mother? It would mean a lot to us. I would like that ring to live on, I say. From one glance at her I know that Val is dying a little inside, but I push through. I understand if you don't and there's no hard feelings there. I just thought it would be special. My father grumbles something but I think it's just nonsense. He's staring down at his uneaten salad, frowning, lips moving. Then he looks up at me. I think your mother would like that very much. He swallows thickly. And I'm realizing that for the first time in a long time, my father is actually showing some emotion. Shite. I think this actually means something to him. Relief and guilt tumble inside me and I'm not sure which feeling will win out, but all I know is this is what I wanted. Isn't it? He looks at Val I loved Padraig's mother very much, and she was, she was taken too soon, he says, an undercurrent of grief in his voice. They both were. Both? Val asks, and I realize I should have explained to her just how my mother died. He didn't tell ye, he asks, surprised. I guess this would be the kind of thing she should know if we've been together for a year. I didn't have the heart, I say feebly, as if that explains it. The heart to honor your sister, he says. Sister? Val asks. She looks at me. I thought you were an only child. No. My father says gruffly. No. He had a sister. 
For five days. For five days in the hospital room, in that wee incubator, there was Clara. My wife died giving birth to her. Clara died five days later. This time the silence is oppressive, pressing down on us in all directions. Even the major seems to have heard what was said. I would have told Valerie everything about my mother and Clara, in time. But we've only known each other a few days and it slipped my mind. There's so bloody much going on right now. Oh, I'm so sorry, Valerie says to him emphatically, her hand at her heart, and I know she's probably mortified for asking. Padraig had told me how she died but he was so emotional every time he brought it up that I didn't press for details. God, she's a good liar. That's completely understandable, my nan says. Now, Colin, tell Padraig he can have the ring so everyone can eat their stew before it gets colder than a nun's teat. My father clears his throat used to my nan's language. Of course you can have the ring, Padraig. He looks to Val Valerie, he says to her, you seem like a lovely young lady. I'm happy I get to know you better over the next few weeks or months or however long you're staying here. Ah, fuck. In the car we'd come up with the plan that Valerie was flying back home next week to see her family and then would play it by ear after that. Come up with some believable reason why she couldn't come back. I'm staying as long as you'll have me, Valerie says. My brows shoot to the ceiling. Does she actually mean that? And when she meets my eyes, she gives me an impish smile, and I know she does. She's staying. I'm not sure how but I know that suddenly, this whole charade is about to get even more complicated. Valerie. For the third time in a row, I'm waking up with a bit of a hangover. Last night after dinner. We all retired to the sitting area by the fire, and the major brought out the whiskey. There were cookies that Padraig's grandmother, who keeps insisting I call her Agnes, whipped up on a whim. Padraig was forced to talk about rugby and all the different teams with the major, and occasionally his father would throw in his two cents about what team was faffin about and so on. Me. I stayed snuggled under Padraig's arm, smiling at the warm and cosy scene while simultaneously being terrified. I may have just agreed to stay longer in shambles without consulting Padraig first. I didn't know what to do. One moment there was a giant bombshell exploding in my lap at the fact that his mother not only died during childbirth but that he had an infant sister that died five days later. The next moment his father was looking at me with the kind of softness that I'd taken must be rare for him, telling me I could have her ring, and so when they asked how long I planned to stay, I couldn't tell him I had a flight back home next week. It didn't seem believable and it didn't seem right. Like, thanks for the ring and the Irish stew, CYA. So I told them I was basically staying for as long as Padraig was and, well, I think that may have created some problems. Problems I then decided to handle by drinking copious amounts of whiskey and passing out on the couch. Thankfully that happened after everyone had retired to their rooms. I remember Padre carrying me upstairs and putting me on my bed, and the last thing he said was, 
we'll talk about it in the morning. Well, now it's the morning. It's sunny out, not a cloud in the blinding blue sky, but the tip of my nose is cold and the window is frosted. I reach over and grab my phone, seeing a joint text from Sandra and Angie, plus one from my friend Brielle, all asking me how I am. I think I'm staying longer, I text my sisters. Good. Such a cool country. Might extend my vacation ha ha lol, I text Brielle. I get out from under the covers and quickly get dressed, shivering as I go, putting on fleece-lined leggings and a big sweater. After I've washed up, I check my phone to see the reply from my sisters. I knew it, Sandra. Are you sure you know what you're doing? She's a big girl and she can do what she wants and you know she needs the D. This is Sandra. She knows it's you. You don't have to keep saying Sandra. You're right. She knows you're the dream crusher. I don't bother texting Sandra and the dream crusher back. Not right now. I have to sort it all out with Padraig first. I head down the creaky narrow staircase to the dining room, surprised to see it empty, even though there are table settings out. I poke my head in the kitchen to see Gail by the stove, putting on a kettle. Am I late for breakfast? Sorry, I forgot to set an alarm. She looks at me calmly. You're not late. Where is everyone? She raises a brow, as if amused that I don't know where my fiancé is, and says patiently, Padraig is at the muse. Colin is watching TV at the cottage. Agnes is doing the washing and who knows where the major is. Oh. Thank you, I say, starting to leave. Aren't you hungry? You've not had breakfast. That's okay. Sit down. I'll bring you food. Oh, that's no problem. I can do it myself. She keeps that level stare. It's my job. Please, tell me what you want and I'll bring it to ye. I'm about to tell her anything is fine but I think I need to be more direct with her, and probably everyone in general. Eggs, bacon, beans, I tell her, since that's the breakfast I've been having since I got to Ireland. Thank you. She shrugs and gets to work, so I go back to my seat and sit down. I'd only just met Gail last night but I have a feeling she doesn't like me. Or maybe I'm just being paranoid, because she wasn't overtly friendly to anyone. Still, she stared at me a lot, and judging by her expression, I don't think she had kind thoughts. She comes out with a plate of fried eggs doused in pepper, streaky thick bacon, beans, and grilled tomatoes and mushrooms, plus big slices of toast. My stomach growls loudly at the sight. Yum. See, I knew you'd be hungry, she says, sitting down across from me and nursing a cup of tea in her hands. You were really getting into the whiskey last night. I think this is her attempt to belittle me but I just shrug. Hard to say no when you're in such good company. Then I shovel the eggs into my mouth. She eyes me with a slight level of disgust, 
And judging by how thin she is, she's probably putting the way I eat and the size of my body together. I'm used to that with my mother. I'm not going to let it bother me on the other side of the Atlantic. So, you're getting married to Padraig, Gail says, her voice tight and chipper. You're a lucky lady. You do know that, don't ye? Of course, I say, trying to swallow. He's the best. But you've only known him for a year. It's a bit soon to get married, don't ye think? Oh God, I heard this crap when I was engaged to Cole. Although in hindsight, they had been right. But it won't happen this time, I think. And so now of course I'm actually crazy because I'm fretting about our completely fake relationship. 